even though you have everything right in your arbitration clause, it doesn't mean that your your users are actually agreeing to this. Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, contract lawyer and litigator Farva Joffrey tears down the arbitration clause in Uber's terms of service. Uber has put a lot of care into the little details in this arbitration clause, but some states have still said it's not enough. So let's tear it down. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. I'm Mike Whalen. The purpose in the show is exactly what it sounds like. We take contracts, we beat them up, we are mean to them, we insult them and their families. Uh, and then we're nice to them at the end. We lift them up a little bit emotionally. I hang out with smart friends uh, like Farva, Joffrey, Farva, how are you today? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. I like that you say well, you say it appropriately. And I'm just not going to do that because I know how to use whom in a sentence, but I will never do it. By God, I will not do it. <laughs> These are the standards we live by. Uh, today, speaking of nerd stuff, we are looking at a contract. Only people like us we'll have a fight about whom. Uh, but we're looking at contracts as we do on the show. Today, we are looking at this document. This is the terms of use for Uber for being a writer, I believe. Is that is that right, Farva? That's correct. Okay, so we're looking at this document. Before we get started, Farva, tell me what this thing is. When are we going to run into it as a lawyer? When might, might we draft something like this? What is this document? So this is a terms of use for Uber, the rideshare app. As an attorney, if you are helping a new company get started or helping a company revise any sort of terms of use that might be on their website or on an app, this is something that you'll probably be drafting. Yeah, it's a common, pretty common click through e agreement. And I said click through on purpose. We'll talk about that later. But before we get to that, Farva, tell me about you. What's your background? What brings you to this kind of document? So I'm a contracts lawyer. I'm based in New York. I practice in New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Massachusetts, and Maine. Uh, so I uh, review different types of contracts for small businesses, for larger businesses, mid-sized businesses, typically tech companies, uh, but sometimes just small businesses as well. So that's me. Awesome. And you do some litigating, if I am not yes. mistaken, right? Yes. So awesome. that's sort of the, the a bit the interesting take that we're, we're going to pull on this because we're going to look at this. Uh, as a document, and you're going to give some critique of this thing as a document, but also in the context of some litigation that went on in Massachusetts that we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, before we get to that story, let's start with the beginning of this thing and some big, bolded words about arbitration. How do you feel about this early? Let's get it out of the way. You're waiving your right to a normal trial. Good practice? I would say for the company, it's a good practice. And also sort of for the consumer, it's a good practice as well, because you know what you're getting right up front. I don't know how uh, effective it is in every single court, but they do. Uh, Uber does make a really big deal out of the fact that you are signing up for binding arbitration, whether you're a rider or any user of the app. So they have that in the first section and then they go on to it and spend an entire second section on just arbitration alone, which is awesome. very unique. Yeah, and we're going to dig into that. Um, give us the context a little bit. I know we talked a little bit. There's this trial in Massachusetts. We'll make sure to include an article uh, in the blog post about this that details this this trial. But tell us about what happened in Massachusetts and what it kind of spun on uh, for, for this document. So a Massachusetts man who was blind, he tried to get into three different Ubers with his seeing eye dog, and he was rejected from all three Uber cars. So he sued Uber for dis disability discrimination. And um, he had to go through arbitration. And when he lost at arbitration, uh, his lawyers then appealed and they were able to um, get in front of the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, which is a state court that stated that um, uh, the, the litigant, he did not actually have to go through arbitration. He was not bound by arbitration because just because there's uh, a terms of service available on the app, he didn't have to take any sort of affirmative action to agree to those terms of services, and therefore he was not bound by them. Yeah, and they make a really interesting comparison to the drivers, right? Because famously, Uber is really purposeful about making sure everybody knows that the drivers are not employees, they are contractors. And so, you know, they point out in, in that uh, uh, ruling that the drivers have to push two buttons to say, I get it, I really get it. 
uh, but for the passengers, they just said no. And I, I would point people to the, the very top of this thing. Um, the second paragraph says, by accessing or using the services, you confirm your agreement to be bound by these terms. If you do not agree, don't use the services. Uh, for you, you know, when you're dealing with looking at contracts like this or even drafting contracts like this, what are you feeling about these sort of deemed to have accepted things? It seems like sometimes there's a use for that kind of thing, right? Like if you're doing, I don't know, if you're if you're accepting delivery of a product, for example, the idea that everybody's going to stand around and read documents, not realistic. When might you use this kind of deemed to have read language versus not? Well, if you remember in, in law school, for most of us, we um, really saw uh, that sort of contract exchange early on, that early, that oral contract exchange, basically you can accept an offer by committing some sort of overt act. So in some cases that totally makes sense. So if I call my plumber and I tell my plumber, hey, I've got you know a broken pipe here or my bathroom's not working, he's not gonna at, send over a document for me to review and sign. He's just gonna come over and perform the service. And basically him performing the service was him accepting the agreement and me promising to pay him something. However, in this case, in Uber, I don't think the same thing applies here, and I don't know how effective it would be for many technology companies. Um, it's just uh, very, uh, it, there, there's a lot of legalese that go into these documents. The, um, the terms you're agreeing to are not exactly straightforward. So I don't think that it's going to, it, it really works for Uber to say, if you get in one of these cars of a third party provider, that means that uh, you agreed to all of our terms and service terms right. of service. I think it's important that they keep making that distinction that drivers are these third parties, but you agree to everything that we're telling you by getting into those cars. It doesn't really make sense. Yeah, and I'm sort of thinking like a reasonableness standard, like you're using a technology that the the whole interface is you're playing with a technology. Put one more button in there. How hard is this? Um, but you know the the case really hinged on arbitration. This is such a hotly contested issue. So I want to dig into the arbitration section of this document. Uh, lead me into that. Tell me about the arbitration section, the scope of it, the breadth of it. How do you feel about it? What do you think about this arbitration section? It's a very in-depth and broad arbitration agreement that comes right in the front of uh, the terms of use. It is section number two. It's prefaced in section number one, so you know it's coming. And it basically tells you all the ways in which you're waiving your right to go to trial. So it tells you that by using this app and by agreeing to these terms of use, you're not going to be entitled to a trial by jury. You have to bring arbitration. And basically, there's only a few circumstances in which you can go to trial and you can actually bring this in a court of law. Right. But long and short of it is really that you're stuck in arbitration, which involves a lot of things, including heavy fees. Yeah. So I assume a sort of a setting you're in arbitration as kind of the default background thing. And then B talks about exceptions to the arbitration. Tell me about A and B, the relationship, and what do you think about the language in B in terms of exceptions? So in A, it basically is very, it seems like it's very broad. It says, you know, any dispute, any claim or controversy in any way that's ar arising out of these terms or any previous versions, you have to bring those claims in arbitration. So section one is actually extremely broad. Um, but and, and section one is also where they tell you that you're waiving the right to a trial by, by jury. Um, it also tells you that you can't be a member of any sort of class action. Section two is slightly different. So section two talks about the exceptions to the arbitration. And I think this is actually drafted pretty well. Mm -hmm. It basically talks about the three singular cases where you can sidestep arbitration and you can go into litigation. So you can go to any court that's in your state. They're not even telling you you have to come to California. They're saying that if you have a small claim, if you have been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted, or if you're seeking injunctive relief, which of course an arbitrator cannot give to you, that's only something that a court of law can give to you. Those three circumstances are the only circumstances in which you can go to court. And I think that's actually very tight and, and it's done pretty well. Yeah, I'm wondering, I mean, there's got to be a story behind why sexual har harassment and sexual assault claims are not brought through arbitration. I, you know, I would assume maybe there's a, a legislative, there's there's a rule somewhere uh, in one of the states that Uber operates in. I don't know. Is is that unusual to carve out something that specific in this kind of? I mean, to your point, you know, if you're looking for injunctive relief or if you're doing small claims, that makes sense. But do you have any idea what the background is on the sexual harassment section? 
I think the background actually comes from something specifically with Uber. There was a lot of cases, I think, early on in the days of Uber where drivers were sexually assaulting right. passengers. Um, and so obviously, and there was the Me Too movement, obviously. So mm. I think that um, they there was an amended version of um, Uber's terms of service. And in 2017, which is, a, which is the version that's currently on their website, um, right after Me Too, right after a lot of these cases came out about Uber drivers assaulting um, you know, women who were getting into these cars, I think that's when they made an amendment and said, you know, in, in those cases, you don't have to take that to binding arbitration that can go into a court of law. It might have been a PR thing. It might have been, you know, terms right. of a settlement. But um, it, it is very interesting that yeah. that's, their, that's a distinct circumstance. I remember all those stories. OK, so moving to C, the rule. So A says it's almost always going to apply. B says, here's the few cases it doesn't. C, we get into the rules in governing law, uh, talking about the AAA rules. What do you think about C? So this is very interesting, and I don't, um, I don't think I see this in a lot of terms of use. So Section C doesn't just say that you have to go to arbitration. Section C says you have to use AAA, the American Arbitration Association. So you can't use JAMS. You can't use any other um, you know, arbiter. You have to use the American Arbitration Association. So um, basically, you're also giving authority to Uber to, to, make, to, to make that arbitrator the final um, decision maker of the claims. Uh, and also, there's nothing in here in, in, in Section C about state or federal law. They don't say, oh, like, you know, all applicable federal and state laws are going to apply. They specifically say that the Federal Arbitration Act is what's going to govern the interpretation and the enforcement of the proceedings. So it's actually very specific. Some of these... Um, some of these bigger companies, they'll try to say, oh, like all these different laws are going to apply. The Uber was actually very specific, which which kind of indicates to me that they've gone through many rounds of drafting the terms of use. And also they've seen where all these other companies like Amazon have gone wrong. Right. Um, so I think they've actually learned from other people's mistakes and probably some of their own mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I, you you would know this better than I do, but I'm, I'm imagining, you know, sometimes you can tell in an agreement, did outside counsel write this or did in-house counsel write this, right? The outside counsel will just cover every basis. It's in like another language. But you, when in-house counsel does it, you can almost see the stories coming out of it, right? You can see that we tried this. It didn't work. We did something else. It, you get these very specific instances. And I'm getting the vibe from this, like, this has been well and thoroughly reviewed. Um, go, take us down to D. Again, this is more of the process stuff, yeah, for if you decide to go to uh, uh, arbitration. Right. So this is actually also very unique. They basically walk you as the rider through what you have to do to start arbitration. They give you an instruction manual in their terms of use. It's not a thorough instruction manual, but it's more than most companies will give you. So they tell you what you have to do, which is basically send in a claim to the to the AAA. You have to, to file a demand, and then you also have to notify the legal department at um, at Uber. So they actually walk you through the step, and they even tell you who the arbitrator is going to be. They indicate that the arbitrator will be some kind of retired judge, an attorney licensed to practice law in the state where the arbitration is occurring, and it also says that. The two of you, Uber and the and the passenger, the rider who is suing uh, or, or bringing Uber to arbitration, you will have a meet and confer and discuss which arbitrator you want to use. If you can't figure out somebody, then the AAA is going to appoint an arbitrator. All that kind of detail that isn't typically in a terms of use. So I think that's also a product of having gotten it wrong many times, seeing other companies get it wrong many times and adapting. Yeah. Uh, in E, uh, it talks about location and procedure. And I'm thinking about even down in seven, we talked about this a little bit beforehand that, you know, they really seem to be trying to get near you. What do you, what do you think about the location and procedure portion in E? Well, I think that they're trying to avoid an argument that it would be um, too prohibitive to, uh, you know, be arbitrate your case in, 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 in if you're in Maine or if you're in New York or if you're in Florida and try to arbitrate a case in California, it makes things a lot more difficult, and you have to keep in mind that the terms of use was written. Um, I think that this version is from 2017, so it's before COVID-19. So everybody was doing everything in person all the time for the most part. Um, it's only in today's economy where the you know it, arbitration takes just a few minutes to to get up from your your um, your bed to your desk and to get on uh, an arbitration proceeding, uh, but that didn't exist back then. So I think the whole point of the location and procedure was to avoid any arguments that it would be prohibitive. Basically, Uber is admitting 
that they're not going to try to, you know, drag you out to California. They're, they'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk about this a little bit, but we had done a previous episode about uh, uh, Amazon local drivers and how that impacted an arbitration clause. It's just an interesting thing how they they really seem to think about how burdensome is the arbitration experience in terms of enforceability in a court. But we, before we get to that big picture, I just wanted to ask you, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up about this particular document and how they handle arbitration? It sounds like you like it. You think this is pretty good, pretty good practice. Yeah, for the most part, I think it's it's good, but uh, the way that it was executed or the way it's been executed in the app was poor. And that's why the Massachusetts court had ruled against Uber in that case and said, you know, even though you have everything right in your arbitration clause, it doesn't mean that your your users are actually agreeing to this, to, to, to be bound by this. Um, I think the other thing that Uber did pretty well was that it, it, it spells out that you have to pay all of these filing fees. Um, I mean, it's sort of a deterrent to the user, if, especially uh, if they're not really used to or, or they're not accustomed to um, arbitration and they don't understand how expensive it can be and that you're paying a judge by the hour, or you're paying the, the jams or the AAA staff by the hour. Um, but they do tell you that explicitly in this agreement that you're going to be paying and responsible for all of these different AAA fees. Hmm. I mean, there's a practical matter, like stepping back and thinking about the bigger picture of drafting arbitration clauses and trying to get them to freaking work. Like, it seems like every time I have a conversation with somebody about arbitration clauses in this context, it it didn't work. And obviously, that's the only time it sort of comes into our into our view. But I assume the majority of arbitration cases, I mean, the fact that this is one of few that then went through a state court and it actually worked, I assume there are very few people who could actually afford to go chase it down in arbitration. And then when that doesn't work, let's go through the state court. I assume that this case was probably funded in some, you know, to make an exemplar out of this thing. Um, if I'm the company and I want arbitration to work, it sounds like Uber did an awful lot to make this thing work. And if the only criticism that the court had was, hey, make people push some buttons, as a functional matter, for them to have had to push the button, that, that probably wouldn't have changed the actual notice to this person either. I, I feel a little bit like clients, you know, companies that are trying to make these things enforceable. It, it's a bit of a blind jumping through hoops. What what advice would you have for lawyers who are drafting these kinds of things to make sure that they're actually enforceable if this is the way that everybody wants to handle these kinds of disputes? I would say... Um, don't write for this. Don't write your terms of use for the state you're in. If you're a multi, um, if you do interstate commerce at all, and you're in Texas, which is less clean or you know less consumer friendly than Massachusetts, which is probably the most consumer friendly yeah. state in America, um, you know, understand that, right? Understand that courts are always going to be looking at you, uh, you know, with a little side eye, right? They're going to be a little skeptical of you if you're a big corporation and they're gonna really wanna protect the little guy. So even though it is kind of a ridiculous argument that you're just adding an I agree button and all of a sudden that means, um, you know, this person is going to read every single word that's in the terms of use. Um, just keep in mind that the little things and the little technical things that you put in your app are going to make um, th they're going to make you more successful and able to overcome some of these challenges in the future. But I think um, whoever was writing the terms of use or who was just you know maybe t maybe tech was not talking to legal in this sense, right? right? So tech was the one who implemented the app for Uber, but legal was the one who drafted the terms of use. So I can see how maybe there was a disconnect between um, you know adding that I agree button. But also it could have just been a lack of foresight because sure. as you said, it's 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 sort of shooting in the dark here. We don't really know what these tech companies have to do. Yeah, if they had thought it all we have to do is put a button on there, they would have absolutely put a button on there, right? That that wouldn't have been hard. I I I'm again, I'm I'm sort of thinking of the big picture context of if you I assume that these companies are looking at okay, if we go through regular state court for every dispute across 50 states and wherever else we are, then here's all the litigation we're going to have to deal with. And here are the costs of that litigation versus, okay, every once in a while, one's going to have to come up. We're going to have to clean up the document. I'm assuming that cost you know, analysis between the two, it is probably still cheaper for them to 
keep editing this dang thing to try to get it right and check all the all the boxes. Absolutely. I mean, they have to, I think, you know, in order to avoid the same problem twice. I mean, this is a public company now. So, I mean, shareholders are going to be pretty angry if they make a mistake and then they don't clean it up in house at legal. Um, right. I mean, it's going to lead to a lot of people selling off the stock. Yeah. Maybe just for expectation setting, if you're going to tell your client you're going to incorporate arbitration, you better warn them that you're going to have to do some edits because you got to get the whom's in there, right? And the heretofores and everybody needs those in the right order. Uh, well, Farvit, thank you for joining us. For people who want to learn more about your practice in New York and what you do for companies, what's the best way to reach out to you? Email is the best way. I'm at farva at joffreylawfirm.com. Awesome. We'll include uh, Farva's contact information as well as uh, a link to this particular document and some of the stuff about the news stories and the, the case that had happened before. That'll all be at lawinsider.com slash resources. And if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show and help us beat up some documents in a super mean way, just email us. We are at community at lawinsider.com. Thank you again, Farva. You guys have a good day. <laughs>